before we get into uh, today's session, I want to ask everyone a question. Um, you know, I want to know what is going to win the day. Is it information or knowledge? So, you know, primarily for those of you that are new that haven't joined us before, have a think about it. Is it information or knowledge? All right, Jack, give us the answer. Not information. Very good. <laughs> um, so we do like to mix it up. You put it there in the negative. Um, it is, of course, knowledge which is going to win the day. Now, you know, let me just break that down so you sort of understand that. You know, information is organised data about something. Knowledge, on the other hand, is um, you know an understanding either through education or experience. So I want to know, you know, have you ever had this happen to you before? Um, you know, going back, say, 20 years ago, uh, you know, I used to spend my weekends going to open houses, going from place to place. You know, I'd take my dad, say, what do you think, dad? What's this? Going to auctions, you know, not even getting a starting bid in there before the prices would just skyrocket out. And what did I do? I started reading everything online. I started studying courses. I started looking at houses that were 50 Ks away. Then I started looking at, you know, building something. And I had all of these different ideas and everything. And you know what? I ended up with what was called paralysis analysis, which is I couldn't make a decision. I was constantly thinking, should I do this? What about that? I can't afford this. Where am I going to go? And I ended up getting nowhere. Um, and I'm sure most of you can relate to that. You may be there right now. Fast forward 20 years and, you know, I've now helped create more than 11,500 homes for people. Um, is what I do day in, day out. And I've understood the system. I've understood that concept of converting that information into knowledge, applying it to my own personal circumstances, helping you apply that to your circumstances um, and creating that actionable knowledge so that you can actually make those decisions, not get caught up, not get stuck and understand how you don't have to waste your time constantly searching through that information, going to open homes and never actually transacting. Um, so, you know, today's session is all about helping you and hopefully setting you on that same path. So if you are stuck, um, you may be experienced, you may have done this a thousand times before. Wherever you are on that journey, today's session is all about helping you unlock that information and turn it into knowledge, as well as helping you understand the process of creating actionable knowledge. So we're going to go for about 30 minutes. Um, what we'll do, I'm going to give a, you a quick wrap on what's happened over the last seven days. Um, we'll run for about five to seven minutes. Um, it'll be short and sharp, just to sort of really set the tone. I also want to um, dig through a few of the themes that I think will be important for questions and I think that everyone should, uh, should jump onto. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, I'll give you a bit of a formal introduction of everyone on the panel later, just before the question section. Those of you that are keen to get in and get in the front of the queue, please feel free to jump in, put your questions in the Q&A, um, and we will have those ready to go uh, shortly as we jump into that section. So what have we seen over the last seven days? There's been a number of key themes, but these were my favourite. Um, CoreLogic put out a really, really interesting research piece talking about the premiums between houses and apartments, and they're at record highs. Let's discuss that in more detail. Um, consumers have saved $140 billion over this pandemic. Um, you know, that is a billion I'm talking about there, not millions, huge amount there. And I think really let's understand how that may impact the economy and particularly the real estate market in the future. Um, you know, Bank of Mum and Dad, it is now becoming one of the largest banks. We've talked about this a lot, um, plenty of thoughts and advice there. Um, residential auction market has been the busiest it's been for about four or five years. Um, with all those transactions and all those volumes, are we actually seeing good clearance rates? We'll run through that. Um, and of course, you know, tips and tricks, buying off the plan can be one of the best things that you can ever do. It can also be a total unmitigated nightmare if you don't know what you're doing and you don't get it right. So we will run through that and give you some tips that you can take home um, and use in your own personal circumstances. So last weekend, um, we did see still Sydney, um, and then Queensland go into lockdown. Um, the auction market was still pretty strong. You know, clearance rates that we can see here were just under nationally 80%. Um, so really, really strong. Uh, Sydney, whilst off a much lower volume in terms of just under 700 uh, properties put up for auction, 
still cracked the 80%, which is a fantastic result. Um, Melbourne, out of lockdown, um, first face-to-face -face auction weekend again, um, and 77%. Again, without quite as strong a volumes as obviously they're starting to just come back on, but really, really strong results. The rest of the country um, went quite well as well. So I think we're still definitely seeing that despite all these lockdowns um, and perhaps people's fears, it is now sort of becoming second nature, particularly for those of us um, that live here in Melbourne. You know, that was lockdown number five. They just keep on rolling one after another. Um, and we've realised that people more and more are still focusing on wanting to make sure that they've got that home, they've got that place to live and that security. So really, really good to see those results. Um, everyone's always asking me, and I know I always make it really important to understand the difference between, you know, backward looking statistics um, as such as what we call lag indicators, which are the auction results, and those that are forward looking, what we call lead indicators. Uh, and that's really important because whilst it's good to see where the market has been, um, you know, part of creating that actionable knowledge is understanding where is the market going. Um, so it's really, really important that you have a good understanding of that. That's why we love to run through realestate.com, put out this great index, um, you know, where they basically take all of that data, they capture about everyone looking at listings both to buy and to rent on their website. Um, and they create a bit of an index as to what actions you're taking. Um, and they try to predict what they expect to see. So, you know, are there more volumes of people searching? Are you taking certain actions? Um, so we're going to drill into the national and the um, Victorian one. Nationally here, we saw uh, buyer demand go up um, slightly over the week. I think that was obviously triggered by the fact that... Uh, Victoria and Melbourne came out of lockdown. Sydney's still there. Um, you know, we've been talking about this now for the last six months. If you're wondering what is the difference in the colour of those lines, um, the red line is apartments and the blue line is freestanding houses and the black line is obviously the average of the two. Um, typically, you can look back historically, historically, you can see there hasn't been a huge gap between those two. Um, it's really opened up in the last six months, continuing to stay open. And I think that's very much a factor of the affordability as prices continue to go up, more and more of the market of buyers who are thinking about buying a freestanding home are finding themselves priced out either in the, the preferred location or just as a whole. And so we're really starting to drill in and focus on those apartments, which I think you know have, have perhaps done a lot tougher over the last 18 months than freestanding homes have. And they're really in for what I think should be um, a bit of a catch up. And I know that we'll have plenty of questions about that um, when we jump into the second section. What have we seen here in our local market here in Victoria? Uh, much the same, obviously a lot more up and down that we've seen coming through. Um, as I said, we've had five lockdowns, so hence a little bit more um, choppiness in those numbers. Um, again, you can see that gap between both the um, apartments and freestanding homes has started to open up, albeit the last lockdown obviously shrunk them down to being very similar. Um, it's opening up again. Um, it's probably only been around for probably the last six weeks or so. And those of you that are long-time listeners will know that um, I often say because of these lockdowns, particularly this section through here where we had the world's longest um, lockdown last year, um, has really set Melbourne and Victoria probably on, you know, a six-month lag to the rest of the country. So, you know, that's why you're probably seeing it start to come. And I think we're going to see stronger and stronger results continue to, um, to compound here in Melbourne as time goes on and see that gap widen again. Um, all right, rental, uh, again, very much the same index here. So for those of you that may be uh, looking to rent a place um, and particularly for those of you on the call today who've currently got an investment property or thinking about moving into that market, um, this is a really great index to have a look at. Um, it measures the same um, sort of uh, indications as I talked about for buying but obviously for those people looking to rent. Um, now, you know, the indexes are great. However, it's, um, it can be somewhat a little bit more uh, harder to read into these numbers. As you can imagine, you know, looking to rent a property is a very low barrier um, transaction. Now, you're talking about committing to 300, 400, 500, 600 dollars a week, as opposed to spending 500 to $2 million on a home plus all of the acquisition costs. So, you know, you can see some spikes up and down here. Uh, there's no doubt we've obviously got a lot less um, or a smaller market in terms of the demand 
for inner city rentals, which is where the vast majority of all of the investment properties are based um, due to the closed borders, as well as these continued lockdowns, obviously sending a lot of those um, typical people that would be residing in those apartments, perhaps they're back to mum and dad's house um, or, you know, they've, they're out of work, so they're not able to afford that. You know, it's still good to see that it's been relatively strong. Um, you know, that level of demand that we're seeing on their websites, if we go back to 2019, it's above that level, um, obviously pre-pandemic. So that's good to see, which is surprising, as I said, without having that level of um, or as, as large a pool of potential renters. Um, so definitely, I think for those of you that perhaps may have had a long vacancy or struggling, let me tell you this, um, speak to your property manager, make sure that they've got it priced right. You're doing everything out there because definitely we're seeing there is a demand out there. There are people looking and people are very, very quick to change over and move over. So you really, really need to be focused, laser sharp on your pricing um, and make sure your property manager is all over what's happening in the local market because you shouldn't have your property um, vacant for more than, you know, sort of eight weeks at most with some changeovers there because people are prepared to move um, and do that. So, you know, hopefully we will start to see this stabilise, you know, into 2022 um, and it becomes a little bit more of a reliable index as those borders open up and we start to see a bit more of a free market um, occurring on there. All right, so um, I've been going on for probably uh, 10 minutes or so. Those of you that didn't catch at the start or haven't joined us before, my name is James Maitland. I'm the general manager here at Salvo and I've helped create more than 11,500 homes for people just like you on the call today. Um, this is what I love doing. This is my passion. Um, very lucky today to be joined on the panel um, by three experts as well. So we've got Greg Arbeck, um, Jack Gian and Lucas Karras. Um, these guys are gonna be answering all of your questions. They've got a wealth of experience. They understand the system. They've got that knowledge. Um, and we're really, really looking forward to um, the answering of all of your questions and getting stuck into today's session. Those of you that don't know how to use the tech, um, you've probably been under a rock. It's really, really simple. There's two ways to ask your questions. Those of you that are brave, feel free to raise your hand and we will um, unmute you and make you live. You can get involved. We love having that. Um, for most people, you'll prefer to do the Q&A, put your questions in there. Um, I can see already down on my screen, we've got a ton of questions already in there. So we will go through those. If we do run out of time, um, we will hang around at the end and answer your questions or try and come back to you um, separately if we didn't get a chance. So with that, that is the formalities and section one done. So let's pack away what we saw happen last week. Think about those themes, get in, get involved, get your questions happening. You know, this is your time. We do this for you. So the more you get involved, the more questions you ask, the more you'll get out of today the more you can turn that information into knowledge. Um, so I'm going to lead off uh, just to get the ball rolling. Um, you know, we were talking about, I've obviously given a, given a rundown about the auctions and so forth. Um, I mentioned about how busy it is um, and what we've seen. So uh, can someone give us a bit of a snapshot? Um, what did we see? Uh, what are these new stats and, um, and what can we expect going forward? Yes, James. So in terms of the auction, so the core logic just released some uh, information about the June quarter 2021, which we just passed. So we happy to say the June quarter 2021 will be the busiest quarter since 2017. So we have 31,000 of the homes were taken to the auction uh, across the combined capital city in three months. And so, Jack, when we talk about it being busiest, you're talking yeah. about there in terms of the volume, the volume. number of homes taken to auction. Yes, yes. But on top of that, we were also saying there is a 75.7% of the clearance rate on, on those huge number, the, the big volume of the property across the, the, the major capital city. So... Um, uh, in terms of the uh, two uh, capital city, Sydney and Melbourne, which is the biggest city, we also seen the historic higher clearance rent. Uh, Sydney is 78.4% and Melbourne is reached to 73.3%. However, in terms of the volume of the, uh, the property on the auction for both cities, we can say the Sydney has 12,000 auction has been hold on. Is more is almost five thousand more than the previous quarter, 
and also the Melbourne, we have 13,000 of the, uh, 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 the property on the auction, which is uh, about 4,000 more than the previous the, uh, the quarter. So Jack, just doing some simple back of envelope maths, um, that sounded to me like sort of 75, 80% of the auctions occur in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, you're talking about 13, 12,000, whatever it is, that sort of seems to be the, the vast majority. But I think what was really interesting there, if I've got it right, is that you know, we're seeing this record level of people bringing their homes to auction to sell, but we're actually still getting record clearance rates. So definitely, you know, those people that might be concerned that will understand that, you know, you've got to look not only at the people that are listing, but are they being realistic? Are they actually transacting? We're seeing record levels on, on both the sell side and the buy side. Yes, yes, 100% right. Okay, so, you know, with that in mind and, you know, thinking about what I was saying to everyone at the start, you know, looking, at the, at looking forward as to what that might mean for them, you know, what can we expect going forward? You know, are we going to still see this high level of, um, of auctions and transactions occurring? What, um, yeah. what are we expecting? Yes, uh, for me, and uh, as, as also you show in the, um, you know, the buy indicator in the very beginning of this session, we also seen the very, very strong the, the demand. It's still there. So I'm pretty confident then that we can expect in the even more strong market coming in the next quarter, half next half of year, and even the next year. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things I guess we often look at and, you know, we find it day after day chatting with people is that, that affordability issue that comes about where, you know, as prices keep going up, people find the deposit they did have saved isn't enough um, or they've got to start looking at different locations. Um, you know, what are we seeing out there? You know, we always recommend to people that one of the best options they can look at is apartments. Um, what are we seeing? Can we give people on the line um, a bit of an indication as to where the, the, the premium difference between freestanding houses and apartments are sitting? James, what we've actually seen in CoreLogic have just... Um put this report out, since March uh, last year is the greatest increase in house, house price and, and the gap between houses and units um, on average is about 30% across the board. So, so that's a national That's a national figure there. Absolutely. So those figures are actually a lot higher between apartments. So the apartment affordability and freestanding affordability, when you look at Sydney and Melbourne, that it goes right up to 54 to and 52%, so over 50% in those capital cities showing that the freestanding house is far more unaffordable than units. Yeah. Do we actually have any, you know, can we put that into to dollars for people? Do you actually have some of those figures, you know, those median prices in, in those main markets? So if we're looking at Sydney, the, the medium house price would be 1.2 million. Yep. Whereas a unit price would be seven hundred and ninety-four, so it's almost half. <laughs> so okay. it's, so that's 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 about four hundred thousand dollars we're talking in, about. So yeah, you know, if we were to put that into, you know, simple calculation for someone, you know, to get a freestanding house, you're talking about one point two million dollars. You know, if you want to have that ten percent deposit, that's one hundred and twenty. You yeah. want to get that twenty percent deposit, so you can cover your costs. That's a quarter of a million dollars. That's, On yeah. the flip side, an apartment is sitting at a median of about eight hundred thousand. So you know, you're, you're eighty thousand or one hundred and sixty thousand. So you know, you're basically a hundred thousand dollars less. You've got to have squirreled away into your bank account to be able to actually get out there and, and buy that median priced apartment. I mean, that's that's a huge difference in anyone's language. I think, Craig. And absolutely. And when you look at Melbourne, which is our market, we, we're looking at, you know, house housing there is 950, 930, you know, as a medium, mm -hmm. whereas a unit is 600,000. So again, when someone's wanting to buy something, it just becomes unaffordable uh, when it's with a freestanding house and units are a far better option because of that gap that's, that's sitting there at the start. Yeah. So, you know, what... Um, uh, Obviously, um, without being the statistician, you told us that nationally the, the, the margin between the two of them sits around 30%. Um, 
yep. our two biggest markets that make up the vast majority of everything are sitting at 50%. Yep. What are we expected to see? You know, is that gap going to continue to widen? Is it going to narrow? Um, perhaps if you've got what the long run yep. um, gap might have been, what, what can listeners today expect um, to occur in the short term and perhaps the long term? Well, on the graph that, uh, again, on the report that CoreLogic has put out, when they look at from 07, it would range sitting at about between 15 to 25% is where, and there'll be certain times where you might find uh, developers have built more and then that gap changes. But yep. generally speaking, we, we're talking about around 20 to 25% would appear over the longer term where the level that the price differ differentiation is is sitting in normal times. Okay. So yeah. um, the question I know that's on everyone's lips, um, I've seen it pop up a few times, is are we predicting that house prices, or, you know, freestanding um, house prices are going to drop to come down to lower mm -hmm. that gap or are we expecting yeah. that apartments are going to go up to... I, I'm, I'm strong. I believe that the, the, the unit prices will start catching up back to those normal levels. Not they won't get reached the same levels as housing, but uh, there's a few things that will help that. Firstly, there've been a few things like home builder you know, that the government put out, which really pushed the ha house and land and freestanding thing. Uh, so that that didn't work for apartments. The affordability issue, as you've just mentioned, is that people will go, we just can't afford houses, so we'll start looking at units. That will start making the unit prices more valuable. We've also seen investors disappear initially, but as we've seen, they're slowly but surely coming back. And as vaccinations and borders open and all these things, units become start looking a lot more attractive. And, and clearly, the affordability issue will make them... Uh, get back to that, that. So they will increase in value, not houses decrease. That's the way I see it. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think for everyone out there, you know, this is perhaps one of those moments in time that you'll look back on in five years, 10 years time and realize this was probably a turning point. Um, you know, if you've got the budget, you've got the, the financial capacity, and you can afford a freestanding house, then great, go and transact. And you know, I think that's a really, really wise decision. So long as you follow the golden rule, which is Greg? Location, location, and then location. Good. Um, <laughs> but if you don't have the budget, you can't afford it, those prices aren't coming back down. But I think as Greg went through, you know, he explained some of those drivers as to why we think prices are going to continue to keep going up for um, apartments and, and attached housing. You know, now is the opportunity. You know, there, there is, has been, um, you know, a bit of a lull. They are probably running, you know, three, four, five, even potentially six months behind house prices. So if you ever were thinking about it and you want to continue to follow that golden rule of real estate, which is to buy in the best location that you can possibly afford, that suits your lifestyle, that matches that type of housing with the demand that is in that market. You know, apartments are a really, really great option. And I think you're going to see, you know, that's going to really, really deliver for you in the long term. So, James, if I can know, just add, add one more point there. Of course, Greg. That um, we've seen a reduction in the amount of building. And as we've, what we've also seen as well as that, and we've discussed some previous things, it takes a long time to get a project off the ground. Now, the fact that a lot of projects have stopped, that will create a shortage. And again, a part, that's another issue why I think apartments at this stage is a really, really good option to get into and looking at uh, over time, you know, the growth that's going to come out of it. Yeah. I think that's a really, really good point, Greg. You know, it's perhaps something overlooked about supply. You know, to build a freestanding home, albeit, you know, tradespeople are notoriously late um, and, you know, you struggle to get them, it's relatively small barrier to go and build a freestanding home. Um, but to go and build um, an apartment complex does take an extraordinary amount of time through the planning process, um, the design process, and then obviously the construction. Um, so, you know, that supply can't just turn straight back on. So we're definitely, um, you know, 
not only all those reasons that Greg outlined before, but as well just thinking that there isn't a lot of new construction going on that has started in the last 18 months. Yeah, there's a lot that's going to be finished that was pre-pandemic, but there hasn't really been anything new started in the last 18 months, which means, you know, fast forward another 18 months or so, there's going to be nothing new getting delivered to that market, just as all those other factors are opening up and life is getting back to normal. Um, all right, so uh, let's change gears for a moment. Um, hopefully we've covered most of the questions there from everyone around those um, issues in terms of supply, um, apartments, premiums and so forth. I want to talk about, um, we had a lot of questions come in over the weekend, um, you know, about where people are sitting, you know, the, the high level commentators always talk about the level of household debt. Um, how does that sit? What should the Reserve Bank be doing? Um, but we saw some interesting research out there. You know, it would appear that people don't actually have as high levels of debt as we may have thought. Um, and in fact, in the opposite, they're actually sitting on a ton of cash. Um, so someone got some of those stats and can run us through, you know, what, what have consumers been doing over the last 18 months? Um, and where actually are those levels sitting? Sure, James. Um, look, uh, as you mentioned, uh, households uh, have been able to save a lot more than what they usually uh, save. Uh, to be more specific, it's jumped from 5.3% pre-pandemic to 11.6%. At some stage, it was even as high as 20% in the peak of the pandemic. So to put that into some numbers, you know, for someone earning, say, $100,000, they might have been saving $5,000 18 months ago. Um, they're now saving $11,000, um, potentially yeah. up to $20,000, you suggested, at the peak. And, and that sort of has created for us a huge $140 billion dollars which are waiting to boost the economy once things return to normal. You normally only ever hear those kind of large figures when it comes to government spending. But, you know, <laughs> we're actually saying here in the opposite, this is what people like you and me and everyone on the line today have actually saved up um, over the last 18 months. You know, we've been quite clever and smart about that. So, you know, where are people actually keeping this cash? Um, and then if they do decide to go and spend it, where could they be spending it? Look, the treasurer said that the income growth, the tax relief and the elevated savings will provide ongoing support for our economic recovery. So now there, there's three ways consumers can choose to spend that, those savings. One way is they could deploy it to finance consumption. Another way is they could use it to further reduce the debt. So they have having the funds sitting in an offset account, which reduces the interest uh, on payments. And the last way, they could use it to acquire equity or property. Okay, so, you know, that's sort of um, like a perfect storm. You know, Greg was talking about that price gap. We've talked about um, where house prices are sitting. Effectively, we've got $140 billion dollars more than we expected to have but for this pandemic and you know people are either going to go out and spend it on the flat screen tvs on their favorite top level scotch as most people do um, but really people have been quite smart this time around you talked about offset paying down debt um, you know that obviously helps put them in an even stronger financial position that they can either leverage that existing real estate into you know perhaps an investment property they might be upgrading or they might actually be buying for this first time which really is going to continue to see why I think Jack was saying we expect to see that level of sales continue to happen as well as those high levels of, um, of clearance. You know, $140 billion is a ton of money to spend, isn't it? Sure is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, let's, let's look through that. Uh, for those people that are looking to buy, you know, first home buyers, whilst uh, investors have slowly started to come back a little bit, first home buyers are still one of the biggest segment of the market. And I'm sure most of you on the call today um, are probably looking to buy your first home. So, you know, where is one of the biggest sources of funding coming from? It is our old favourite, the bank of mum and dad. So, you know, we've talked about those affordability constraints. We've talked about how much you need to have put away to buy the average house in, uh, in Sydney, or even the average apartment still requires a huge amount of savings. Um, so people more and more are looking towards help from the bank of mum and dad. 
Um, you know, how can, you know, if you are a parent on the line looking to help your children um, or you are looking to buy a, a property and you obviously need help from the bank of mum and dad and you want to suggest to them how they could help you, what are some of the options that, that parents out there can help and, um, and how might they do that? Yes, James. So traditionally, I mean, first of all, the bank mum and the dad it will be now, it will be the largest uh, sales for the first home buyer, especially for the young people when they're looking to buy their first property. And uh, traditionally, I think the dad and parents, they're helping the kids to fill in the gap, financial gap when they put in the deposit. But since we're talking about the affordability could be the issue and that the house will be more expensive, like freestanding house, you need to have like a quarter of the million dollars to put into the deposit, which is almost in impossible. So the bank mom and the dad, they can either lend in the money to the, to the children or it's become increasingly like they bring the uh, forward of the, um, the inheritance to the kids. So, you know, I guess that's becoming more and more relevant as, you know, most people know what a great asset, you know, owning their own home has been and, and how well it's done for them. So they don't want to see their kids miss out on that. But, you know, typically you think of the inheritance as when the parents die and they leave everything to their children and, and whoever else may be the beneficiary of that. But to bring that forward, um, I'm assuming that's going to take some careful planning and, and there's potentially a fair few risks involved in that. Yes, of course. Like it's, uh, it, all the parents, if you're planning to give in the kids the inheritance, before you make the decision, you need to do some like self, um, you know, the, the, the assessment. Because all the parents, they have the asset or whatever they want to be, they have to be uh, easy, enjoy when they retire. And they not be gonna in the risk when they give in the early um, inheritance to the kids. It's also involves some like a tax issue. For example, if you're giving the share to the to the kids or giving your your family house, you might uh, you might need to pay the capital gain tax. And so that's kind of the things that parents need to consider in before they make the decision. Yeah, I mean, I guess there'd be nothing worse for all the parents <laughs> out there that um, you want to help your kids out you bring forward, give them some extra money beyond just closing that gap that Jack spoke about, only to find that the roles are reversed. And in 10, 15 years time, you're asking them to, um, to bridge the gap because you've given them too much too early. Um, so, you know, look, that's obviously an important thing, but I think definitely we could go on forever about that. But, you know, for those parents out there, you know, really that do have the ability or do have those assets, um, you know, it's definitely something you should look at. And I think we have a few weeks ago, um, or at least on a number of occasions, run through some of those different options that you've got um, and how they could go right or wrong. But, you know, what um, for most people that are worried, um, you know, I think probably the number one thing as a parent that they're worried about is, is giving money to, um, to their kids that perhaps are in a new marriage or, or might be buying a home with their, their long-term partner and the concern when that breaks up. What, um, what's one... Um, sort of tip or recommendation that we can give to uh, to those mums and dads out there now that might help protect um, that money, particularly that they want it to go to um, to their child? Yes, I think in terms of this issue, I think the parents need to um, think about is maybe the lending the money or have the loan, which uh, needs to be documented before they give in the, to, the, to, the, to the kids, rather than giving the gifts. Uh, to, to, to the children and when their marriage break up, just in case the marriage or the relationship break up is become like a family issue, which is, um, you know, uh, financially and also is, is not good for the family and for the parents. Okay, good. Um, all right. So, you know, um, let's sort of uh, wrap up here. We've been talking a lot about, you know, where prices are going. We're seeing that gap. Um, we've talked about the bank of mum and dad helping out. What sort of options are there out there for people if they don't have parents that might be able to help them or you know, they can't actually bridge that gap? What are some other alternatives that can help people get in the market, you know, particularly in terms of getting into um, perhaps an apartment? Um, what are some options out there that uh, we can help our listeners on the line with? Well, James, I think... Uh a favorite of mine, which is purchasing off the plan. 
buying a property uh, well before well before it's even construction has even begun. So for those uh, listeners out there, I do have some uh, nice tips and tricks that they should be uh, looking out for while uh, buying off the plan. So just to clarify for everyone in case they're not 100% certain um, around it, you know, buying off the plan, can you perhaps give them the, the 30 second overview of what, what it is, how much you've got to put down and, and how it works? Sure. Buying off the plan, you, normally you would meet at a display suite where you will be able to have a look at the architectural floor plans and drawings of the building with some images of what the finishes will appear to be at the end. And you can lock in that property at the price that is available to you at the time. Uh, and all you've got to do is pay a 10% deposit with a balance due at settlement. So there's no progress payments. You just pay 10% now and the balance when the property is ready. Okay. And potentially even no stamp duty as well. Uh, correct. There's huge, huge benefits. So right now you, you save on the stamp duty, um, which, which is a very big thing. Okay. So um, it's obviously gotten a bad rap off the plan properties. You know, there are some great projects and it can be one of the best decisions you can possibly ever make. It can also turn into a, a total nightmare. So I think you said before you're going to give us some tips. So fire away, tell all our listeners um, your top tips as to how they can make sure that it becomes a dream come true rather than a nightmare. Look, I mean, locking prices early, getting the luxury finishes and, and extra time to save, they're all good positives. But when you're purchasing, you've got to be careful um, you got to make sure you purchase from a reputable, good developer um, because sometimes you can get some serious defects, delays, or even developers go bust. So it's very important to do the, some research before you commit into anything. So, you know, other developers, some developers use uh, materials, you know, promotion materials that show things not the real way. And, and you might even walk into a display which is something amazing, but when you purchase your property, none of those finishes are inside the apartment. So these are some of the tips. Uh, number one, which is one of the important tips, is, is time to save. So from the time you pay the deposit until the property is ready for settlement, uh, it gives you the sort of uh, time to save some of money. And it also motivates buyers to, because they've got a deadline, it motivates them to save more rather than just waiting for the right property to show up eventually. Uh, locking in a price. So like we also touched before, buying off the plan in a rising market, it's a very good financial sense because when the settlement arrives in two, three, sometimes even four years, uh, the property has increased in value and, and you have only 10% of that to depart for that period. So it's a great way to make some uh, good uh, capital gains. Now, this thing that you've got to be careful of is lenders make the call. So if you purchase at a higher market price, when the settlement comes, the lender most likely won't give you the balance that you need to settle. Uh, and it'd be a shortfall. So you either need to come up with extra cash or risk losing your 10% deposit. So this is why it's important when you do buy off the plan, do your research and make sure you're buying at the right price. Don't rush in. Um, the waiting game. So while you're waiting for settlement to, to occur, we all know that circumstances can change. The market fluctuates, bank letter policies, bank lending policies change, uh, valuation, all these things can result in reduced borrowing capacity. So that means that the buyer either has an option to on sell or nominate the property, uh, or they need to have additional funds to make up the any shortfall, if there's any. Now, cracks can appear. So, you know, if the apartment doesn't meet the building standards, you won't have to complete the contract of sale, which is not a bad thing because you get up your deposit so you don't lose anything. But sometimes little things like the quality and the finishes are not what you expected and there's nothing you can do about that. Once again, make sure you buy from a reputable developer, somebody that's been doing this for a long time, and you can see what they've done and you can trust them. And lastly, developers can go bankrupt. 
So we've seen this many times. And, and although if your money is in a solicitor's trust account, of course you're going to get it back. Your money is safe. But if you're waiting for four or five years, the market after four or five years might have changed and increased so much that you can no longer get into the market and buy what you had originally secured. So these are the sort of six tips and, and things to watch out for when purchasing off the plan. And I assume anyone who's keen to do that, 1-800-BUY-FROM-LUCAS. I couldn't have put it better myself. All right, I can see Greg squirming and getting very I, upset. I just went, I said, hang on, um, unmute, 1-800-BUY-FROM-LUCAS. All right, right look, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a great wrap. We've gone a fair bit over time. Um, there was a lot to get in there, so I really wanted to finish that off. Um, if we haven't got to your question, I will hang around after this um, and answer some more of those questions. So I just want to wrap it up with a couple of key closing um, thoughts. So, you know, the way that I see it, today's been fantastic. We've shared heaps of information. You know, you guys have all been active. You've participated. You've given it your all. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. But, you know, where to from here? You know, for most of us, you're going to do nothing. You know, you're going to say that was good, but you're busy. Things will get the better of you and you're not going to actually make any changes. You're perhaps not going to take on board what we've discussed. And that's okay. But I just want to leave you with this thought on, on that option. If you don't make a change, then don't expect to get a different result. So, you know, I told you at the start of, of um, this session about how, you know, I got caught in what we call paralysis analysis and I didn't actually do anything. You know, Lucas talked you through some of those pitfalls and those tips where you might get stuck locked up in something and then find everything's got away from you. It's exactly the same with doing nothing. So, you know, really think about that before you decide just to, um, you know, log out now or to not actually take action. Um, and I'm going to tell you how you can take action in a minute. Now, at a bare minimum, what I really, really implore and hope all of you will do is take on board what you learned today, have a think about it, readjust what you're doing, understand that concept of actionable knowledge, you know, we've run through it, and really, really employ that and go out there and make those changes yourself and get your fast track journey happening. But there is an alternative, and this, I believe, is the best course of action you can do. And what I really, really hope you do is to let us help you. you know, go on that journey with us. Let us help you build that um, actionable knowledge. Let us walk you through. You know, let us be the ones to fast forward and move you further, quicker down that track. Um, how can we do that? Well, you know, there's a lot of ways we can help because there is a lot of things that we do. You know, it can be as simple as just helping you, you know, refinancing an existing property. Um, you know, you could be at the start of your journey, but the best way to do that and the smallest time commitment you can possibly make with still expecting to get a realistic um, outcome is to have a one-on-one. -on -one. So what I've done is I've set aside time specifically for these catch-ups because they do book out. Everyone is busy. Um, in everyone's diaries to have a one-on-one -on -one with you. Now, it is the easiest thing you can possibly do. You don't have to come and see us face-to-face. -face. You don't have to travel to the city. We can do it over the phone. We can do it via Zoom. We can do it with WhatsApp. We can do it FaceTime. Or, of course, we'd love to see you face-to-face. -face. It's really, really simple. These things are about 15 to 20 minutes. Very similar to today's session. We'll have a quick chat about where things are sitting with the market. Um, get a bit of an understanding from you where you are on that journey. Um, and really try and understand if you are a good fit for us. Um, we're not going to be able to help everyone, but ideally at the end of this um, session, you know, we'll have an idea as to whether we both think we can work with each other um, and where we might be able to help you, which one of our businesses is best placed to, to help you fast forward that journey um, and really set forward a framework as to how we might move forward together. So I really, really think these are some of the best things that you can possibly do. And there is little to no commitment on your behalf. Uh, so for those of you that are wondering, yeah, but I don't think I'm ready for it or I want to do something else, well, let me tell you, if you are still listening now, you are ready and you are the right person for this. You know, you've got to be motivated. You've got to be prepared to do the hard work. Roll up your sleeves. Understand that concept of actionable knowledge. But even if you don't, be prepared and open to learn it and understand it. And, you know, I can guarantee you that even if you end up going down a different path, you know, just a small amount of time spent with us helping go through these concepts really will help set up that framework so that you aren't stuck like I was 20 years ago, going nowhere, worrying about everything, going back and forth and ending up finding after a couple of years that you've gone nowhere 
and you've just been stuck. So don't let that happen to you. Take action, take those steps, book one of those appointments now. I really believe it will get you the results that you're looking for. So if that does sound like you, it's really, really simple to do it. Should be a link in the chat, jump on, book your spot now. Uh, for those of you that have joined Zoom Live, um, your web browser should have been redirected to that booking page. And lastly, for those of you that don't have your diaries with you or you're not sure what time is best for you, um, we'll send you a follow-up email with the link and you can book it through there. So I know this will get you the actions and I really, really hope that, um, that we do move forward um, and that we do see you again. Before I go, I want to leave you with this thought. You know, a few weeks ago, um, I went on holiday to Hamilton Island and, you know, it was a great break. We were there for three or four nights. Um, we did a lot of things, you know, there was a bit of sunshine. It was great to, um, to get out. And, you know, I had a really, really great time, but I have this one memory and, you know, I think it was the, the second night. My eldest daughter said to me, dad, you know, I'd really, really love to walk to the top of the mountain and go and watch that sunset and do that together. And I thought that sounds fantastic. And I said, of course, darling, I'd love to do that with you. Let's do it. Look forward to it. Now, that night, I was setting my alarm. I jumped onto Google, had a look at what time the sun rises. And it was at that moment I realized how early the sun rises, and then how early I'm going to have to get up. And I really, really thought twice. And I was about to, to you know, call out to her and say, you know what, let's not do that. But I thought about it and I thought, you know, how easy is it when your alarm goes off to hit that snooze button? So I didn't do that. I got up. Um, you know, I didn't hit the snooze. We walked to the top of the mountain. Um, it was a great hike and we had a lot of fun and it was a really, really special moment. And that's something that both of us will remember forever. But, you know, what I can say is that I really, really thought twice about doing and getting up on early. You know, we were on holiday and when that alarm went off, I really wanted to hit that snooze button. In fact, I'll tell you, I did hit the snooze button and then 30 seconds later, I realized what I'd done and I, and I jumped up out of bed. So just remember this. You know, it's the people that don't hit snooze, that do take the action, that jump out, out of bed, that will actually get the results. They'll create those memories. They'll get the actions. They will be the ones that will end up with the results that you will be jealous of, envious of, if you don't take that action and you don't um, actually jump up and you hit snooze. So, you know, we will be here every single Wednesday, rain, hail or shine um, at 2.30 p.m. So I really, really hope to see you again. And I hope to see a lot of you um, booking those sessions so thank you very much for your time from me and all of the guys on the panel we've really enjoyed today's session and we look forward to seeing you again next time